I wanted to speak with you today about desire and the role of desire uh, in Hatha Yoga as we understand it. And, and Hatha Yoga, of course, is a, is a somewhat broad, um, you know, a broad category that can uh, include, especially if you look historically back toward the roots of Hatha Yoga, you find you know, not only a sort of uh, a tantric tradition that um, sees the body as a sacred emanation of you know, the deepest principles of reality and indeed the principles of reality that, we, that the heart longs to have intimacy with. But if you go back further, you find something that, at least on the face of it, seems radically uh, opposed, which is uh, a kind of asceticism that is oftentimes about you know, the mortification of the flesh and the sort of you know, dissociation from the body and so on and so forth. Now, those two polarities, uh, those two, let's say, approaches to, to uh, spirituality um, are both very common, very familiar. I would say that they're natural, that we have impulses inside of us toward both of those approaches to spirituality. That is, on the one hand, an approach uh, toward spirituality that's all about transcending the ordinary, transcending embodiment, transcending the sphere of uh, desire. And then, on the other hand, an impulse toward an approach to spirituality that recognizes the, the sacredness of the body and uh, is all about retuning the mind to the enchantment uh, of the sphere of embodiment and so of the sphere of uh, desire. And so if the first approach to spirituality is about transcending the ordinary, in order to uh, have intimacy with the absolute. The second is about recognizing the imminence of the absolute in phenomenal experience, okay? And Hatha Yoga combines both of those approaches to spirituality. Both of those approaches, in fact, in Hatha Yoga, are represented in what is perhaps the sort of dominant, you know, metaphorical or uh, sort of icon of the process of Hatha Yoga, which is a process of, let's say, rousing the serpent Kundalini from her slumber so that she rises through the central axis of the body, piercing through the psychical knots in a movement of transcendence, an upward movement of spiritual uh, aspiration that lifts us into higher and higher, let's say more refined uh, levels of consciousness uh, until you know, eventually there's, it, well, at least in some of the sort of initial stages, there's a gradual you know, disentanglement of our attention from uh, our attachments to bodily phenomena, our attachments to objects of desire, our attachments to particular emotions. Um, and at the sort of height of that uh, process, as it's described, uh, the Kundalini Shakti, which represents the feminine principle, unites with the masculine principle, or Shiva, uh, in the crown of the head, uh, in a moment of in a moment of experience in which the ordinary subject-object structure of experience dissolves, so that it's sometimes said that the hatha yoga happens here um, in the agnya chakra when shiva and shakti unite you're thinking about it, ex extending this physiological metaphor, right? And that's a moment of sort of non-dual 
uh, awareness, or at least a moment in which what suddenly becomes vivid in one's experience is the interconnectedness of one's own subjectivity and everything uh, that falls within the purview of experience, okay? Um, then, <laughs> it's said that the, the lunar disk begins to melt and a cool nectar, the Amrita, the Soma, rains down and floods the body with an unimaginable delight, right? And so this is the nectar pervasion experience and in the nectar pervasion experience, there's that, there's, that's the sort of re-enchantment of the body. The, the movement, that downward movement, that descending movement, if it goes well, if it comes off, because sometimes it doesn't, sometimes Kundalini rises and, you know, she doesn't complete her journey. <laughs> she doesn't rise all the way to the, um, you know, to the space of Shiva and then make that return back into the body, the, the return represents the embodiment of the insight of emptiness, let's say. The embodiment of the insight of, and, and the, 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 the sort of realization of intimacy that is symbolized by the union of Shiva and Shakti. So that descending movement, which is equally essential to Hatha Yoga, as it's traditionally described, is that movement of recognizing the eminence of the sacred in the body and in all objects of experience. Are you guys with me? Is this okay? <laughs> okay. So we have... Um, we have both of these movements uh, of both of these movements of, of the, these approaches of spirituality are sort of integrated and included in the process of Hatha Yoga as it's traditionally described. And what I intend to do for you today is to sort of sketch out what the role of desire is in that process. Okay? Now, if you take this sort of, the, the sort of transcendent uh, approach to spirituality, um, then the, the, the role of de then d desire is very much devalued on that approach. In fact, desire is seen you know, on that approach as a kind of obstacle to, an obstacle to spiritual development, right? It's seen as something that you're supposed to sort of overcome, right? So in the Yoga Sutra, when Patanjali tells us that, you know, the two sort of elements of uh, yoga are vairagya and abhyasa, which means sort of dispassion or renunciation and repetition, you know, we're meant to understand that yoga on that intended approach is all about the sort of renunciation of the, you know, the impulses of the body, the movement of desire, you know, toward worldly uh, things in order to overcome our sort of fixation on the body and our fixation on the phenomenal realm so that consciousness can begin to disentangle itself from these denser spheres of being and make its ascent uh, toward the, you know, toward the uh, higher principles, let's say, of reality, okay? And indeed, you know, that, that is an important part, I, I want to say. I, I want to say that, that if, if Hatha Yoga represents an archetypal movement of spiritual development, and I believe that it does. I believe that what's described by that metaphor of kundalini rising 
piercing through the chakras and piercing through the psychical knots and then melting the lunar disk and the Amrita raining down. I want to say that that whole movement is archetypal. To say that it's archetypal is to say that it doesn't belong to, you know, sp to some specific Indian tradition. It's describing a process that sort of underlies or, or could, you know, can underlie spiritual development as such, regardless of what kind of, um, the, regardless of the signs and the symbols and the cultural context in which that approach is made. Okay. And if that's so, then that movement of transcendence and that sort of, that, that movement of renunciation in which we in some sense disentangle ourselves from our, from our attachments, disentangle ourselves from, um, you know, from the, even from the force of desire, that is, that is acknowledged as an essential part of spiritual development in this, uh, you know, but you know, by ha the Hatha Yoga tradition, okay. But Hatha Yoga ascribes um, a role to desire that's strikingly unlike the role that you would, or the, the, the value that you would place on desire, the role that you would give to desire on a more one-sided approach. That is, if you were sort of squarely within, let's say, an ascetic approach to spirituality, right, then desire would be seen almost exclusively as something to overcome as an obstacle that needs overcoming, okay? But the tantric approach in as ascribing a very different role to desire also gives it a very different kind of value. So that's what we want to talk about. Now there are two ways that I wanna approach this question that's before us now of what is the significance of desire in this sort of tantricized Hatha yoga? And one of them, let's start with, let's start, one of them is mythological, okay? So let's start by reminding ourselves of the basic cosmological picture that we contemplated in our last talk together. That's a picture on which, at the very heart of creation, we have consciousness pulsating with creative energy and spontaneously expressing its creative potential and then reveling in an immediate awareness of its own creative expression. Okay? And according to the, the tantric cosmology that we were considering, that divine revelry is what the, is what the phenomenal world is. So that everything that we experience in our personal consciousness is part of that divine revelry. Right. Now we already noted that if that on a view like that, everything that appears is at least in a certain sense sacred. Right? Because everything that appears is in a certain sense an immediate expression or emanation of something that in its very nature is sacred. 
And so that means that all of our desires and all of our emotions, our fears, our anxieties even, you know, are um, to be seen in a very different light than we might see them if we saw them exclusively as obstacles to be overcome, right? Now, does this mean that we cultivate complete indifference to worldly phenomena, right? Or that we have a sort of uni a, an absolutely uniform response to whatever transpires, let's say, in the political realm or in the social realm, right? And I want to say absolutely not. It does not imply that. So it does not imply, for example, uh, indifference toward um, indifference toward violence or toward um, you know toward humanitarian crises like the one that is unfolding today um, you know in Eastern Europe it does not imply uh, an indifference to those to those things because there's plenty of room left open, right, for the, for all kinds of different responses to what actually appears. In fact, right, recognizing the unique significance of everything that appears in the phenomenal realm, right, is part of attending to it with the closeness and the fineness of attention that is demanded by this view of experience. Okay. In other words, this view of experience is meant to remind us that in fact it matters profoundly what happens, right? That human life matters, that the way that we spend our time matters, right? That whether or not we, you know, live for the wanton pursuit of power and whether we ex express aggression in the way that we live and whether we're willing to sort of subjugate each other you know, as opposed to, for example, recognizing each other as beings with infinite depth, as beings that are, are you know, ourselves direct emanations of something sacred and sublime, and then honoring each other, celebrating each other, supporting each other, lifting each other up, you know, through the, even through the full spectrum of human emotion, the tantric sort of recognition of the imminence of the sacred is meant precisely to remind us that that matters profoundly, immensely, okay? And so it turns out even that it, it, it sort of, it, it matters what we desire and it matters how desire animates us um, because desire is what focuses our attention, right? We, it, you know, that to which we continuously, you know, upon which we continuously hold our attention speaks volumes about what we care about, speaks volumes about what it is that we desire, right? The things that we desire are the things that we continuously, um, you know, that we're drawn toward, that we, that we give our attention, okay? Now, there's this idea that I mentioned last time, that the, the feminine principle, which is just the creative potentiality that's inherent to consciousness, wants to be seen, wants to be heard, wants to be touched, tasted, smelled, etc. It wants to be experienced in its entirety, right? And so it expresses itself for the sake of consciousness being aware of it, which is to say, 
for the sake of consciousness becoming self-aware because all of those creative potentials are implicit in consciousness. When consciousness is thought of somewhat artificially in abstraction from that creative power, it's thought of as the masculine principle, the principle of spatiality, the principle of space within which all of that creative power unfolds, right? And so you have this metaphor um, that you know, predates in a certain way the tantric stories about Shiva and Shakti that um, the feminine, because it's from Sankhya, the Sankhya philosophy, and it's in the Sankhya Karika, that Prakriti dances for the sake of making Purusha self-aware. Right? That the, the feminine principle unfolds and expresses itself for the sake of bringing consciousness into full awareness of what it is. Or in other words, for enacting the process of self-knowledge. Right? The kind of self-knowledge that yoga is which is an immediate awareness of what's actually moving through the space of consciousness, a sort of undiluted, undistracted awareness of that is the self-knowledge, okay? Now, you guys still with me? All good? Okay, wonderful. Now, there's this idea that that Shakti limits her creative powers. She limits certain of her Shaktis in order to sort of condense into the form of these individual embodied beings, that is you and I, right? So, she limits icha shakti, which is the sort of power of, it's sometimes said it's the power of will, you know, or it's the, it's the pow, her power of creation. She limits that along with her jnana shakti, or her power of knowledge, and her kriya shakti, which is her power of, um, of action. And in doing so, she creates the sort of sphere of individual embodied experience. Okay. And in that sphere, we find ourselves as limited embodied beings with a basic sense of impoverishment. A basic existential sense of impoverishment that is beneath our emotions, beneath the experience of our personality, beneath the rationalizations and justifications and sort of narrative structure of our individual selves. At a more fundamental level, there's a basic feeling of existential impoverishment called anava mala, which just is the result of Shakti spontaneously limiting her creative power of Icha Shakti. Okay. And the sort of her spontaneous self limitation of the power of jnana, of, the, of her knowledge, gives us a basic sense of being isolated within ourselves and so isolated within that feeling of impoverishment. That's called maya mala. Mala just means obscuration. So these are the sort of obscurations on our consciousness. Um, And through her spontaneous limitation of the power of action, 
that is of Kriya Shakti, she gives us this sense that we need desperately to do something about this feeling of impoverishment and isolation that we carry around with us. Right? And it's said that out of those, you know, that, that, that from out of that psychological scaffolding, our, our personalities are developed. <laughs> okay. In other words, we find the various things that we desire, right, um, are, you know, in many ways informed by that more primitive structure, more primitive psychological structure, the structure of the malas. Okay. And we find, of course, that, you know, that when we are pursuing the objects of our desires, and we actually attain whatever it is that we're reaching for, right? Because desire has this, it's called, you know, the, there's a great word for this in, in, in ancient Greek, the orexis of desire, which is its directionality or what it's reaching tor toward. Uh, and so the, the sort of orectic, um, the orectic force of desire is always sort of you know, toward its object. And that movement of desire is coming from a deeper source. The mythological picture that we just considered tells us that there's really only one place from which it, it could come, which is Shakti's desire to be experienced by consciousness. Or to put it in the other way that we've already put it, the desire of consciousness to become self-aware, right? So it's part of the creative potential of consciousness to manifest itself as you, as me, right? As this chaotic, confusing world that we live in. And so it does. It does manifest itself that way. Right? And consciousness, that is deeper consciousness, not just our personal awareness, but the, 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 the spacious, the, that sort of deeper sphere of consciousness out of which all of that creative energy, or within which all of that creative energy is moving, right? is holding space for all that and taking all of that in, right, is engaged in knowing itself, knowing what it's like by feeling all of that creative energy move through it, right? But among the various expressions of that creative energy is you and I, together with our own basic sense of existential impoverishment, isolation, and desperation, okay? Now that can sound pretty heavy-handed and you might go, oh no, that's not me, I've got a very different personality, I'm not really all that anxious or desperate, right? But the point is that these things are not describing your emotional body. Your emotional body is more superficial than what's being described. What's being described is sort of, you know, is, is deeper than that, right? And indeed, it's because of that sort of basic sense of, I mean, your sense of impoverishment is like <clears throat> another way that you might experience it, that you might be sort of more amenable to, right? Is that you experience it as a longing for intimacy with the divine, right? You experience it as a longing to get closer to the sources of your being, right? So it's not just what sort of draws you out into kind of, you know, a, a sort of diffuse chaotic materialism. 
It's what draws you to, into spiritual life, that sense of impoverishment. Right? It's what, it's the, it's the, it's, it's, the, it's the energy that makes you a spiritual seeker, if you're a spiritual seeker, and I'm guessing that you are, right? It's the sort of, it's, the, it's, the, it's what animates you to seek, right? If you didn't have that sense um, of being in some way alienated from the sources of your being, there would be nothing to seek, right? And indeed, Shiva and Shakti don't seek each other. They simply revel in the experience of intimacy with each other. They represent a sphere of consciousness in which there is no seeking, right? But for us, in the realm of seeking, insofar as we are within that realm, we are in a realm that's conditioned by the malas. Are you with me? Is this all... Intelligible, good. Good, good. <laughs> now, Desire, as I had said before, is, is what directs our attention toward things, right? So it's, and sort of what we attend to is very different throughout, in different stages of our lives, in different stages of our emotional development, right? The things that we, the things that draw us in, the, even the, you might even say the sort of, you know, the, the dimensions of reality that hold our attention uh, are very different in different phases of our lives. Sometimes it's just different, right? But sometimes there's also, you can detect in that movement of attention through different dimensions of reality, a, pr a, pr a progression, right? Uh, and in fact, you know, according to the, the, the ancient Greeks described, uh, and especially Plato, for example, uh, Socrates in the, in the symposium, uh, in the you know, speech of uh, Diotima, describes a movement of spiritual ascent in terms of a progression of desire. So, he talks about the way that um, that which you find beautiful is probably somewhat superficial when you sort of, when desire first, you know, starts to really, you know, make its sort of, especially erotic desire, starts to make its sort of sudden uh, you know, appearance uh, into your surface consciousness, right? When you're like 12, 14, 16, sometime in there, you are drawn by the energy of Eros to contemplate, you know, to attend to uh, the sort of physicality of human form in a sexualized way, right? And the idea I don't mean to get too much into the, I don't mean to get too much into the, into the symposium here, but the idea is that if you, have a, if you have healthy relationships, educational relationships, relationships that help you to um, develop, um, That is, if, if you've got good support, if there are good adults around you who can help you cope with that, right, then you, and, and you engage in conversation with them, right, about that as you go through the experience of actually pursuing that. Because there's, there's a certain way in which you, 
if you want to have a healthy relationship to that, you need to not just resist it, but sort of accept it as part of your embodiment, as part of your experience, as part of who you are as a human being, and then learn to sort of, you know, to hold that energy and even to allow it to animate you and allow it to express itself through you, right, in a way that is nonviolent, non-degrading, uh, and in a way that is receptive to your own integrity and to the integrity of other human beings, right? And of course, that's something that you, that you learn how to do as a, as a teenager and, and young adult, hopefully, right? Unfortunately, we don't all learn how to do that. Um, and, you know, it's one of the great sort of, you know, symptoms of the dysfunction of modern culture that, you know, so many people, especially but not only men, uh, you, you know, reach an age uh, of, you know, adulthood without, you know, having gone through that process. But if that process goes well, then while you may continue to appreciate the beauty of outward form in human beings, you also recognize it as a sort of more superficial emanation of a deeper beauty, right? Which is, let's say, I mean, this is how Plato describes it, the beauty of the soul, right? So you come, to, you come to attend to physical beauty or what you see as beauty in, physical, in the physical form of other human beings comes to be a reflection of the beauty of human souls. And if you contemplate that and you continue to sort of, you know, to talk about it, even talking about it or contemplating it together with others is an essential part of the process of human development that Plato's talking about, right? And in fact, the name that he gives for that educational process is philosophy, right? It's in the mode of philosophical contemplation or what he meant by philosophical contemplation, which is a kind of a, a sort of discursive, but not always necessarily verbal, mutual contemplation of the beauty of things right? Because it's, it's sort of fundamental to the idea of, of his idea of philosophy that what you're contemplating is what you're drawn toward. And it's also part of his idea that what you're drawn toward is beauty, right? That what you find, you know, that, that in some sense what sort of, you know, what fascinates you is the way that beauty and perhaps its shadow, right, which is, brings in sort of fear and disgust, draws your attention forward. So if you continue to contemplate those things, the beauty of souls, then you start to contemplate sort of the beauty of relationship, the beauty of human interaction, the beauty of harmonious social organization, right? And, you know, it, and, and then you might sort of, you know, be into sort of contemplating communal dynamics and so on and so forth, which is typically not, you know, the purview of teenagers, right? It's usually sort of, you know, yeah, yeah, young and even sort of middle-aged people who are interested in, in such things more explicitly, you know, social psychology and, and so on and so forth. Right? But he says that if and you continue onward contemplating those kinds of things and you come to see it as an expression of some deeper sort of deeper harmonies in nature that perhaps you recognize being expressed in poetry, in music, in the sort of, you know, smooth and sort of, you know, mathematically describable movements of the, of the spheres, of the cosmos, the planets, and so on and so forth. And he says that you continue to contemplate these sort of increasingly lofty things. Now you're in the realm of, you know, natural science and philosophy, right, as we sort of more, uh, you know, recognize it now. And this eventually, um, you know, brings you into such a state 
where the, the object of your contemplation, that which you find beautiful, that which magnetizes your attention, that which in some sense you desire, right, to understand, desire to be closer to, and on some deep level, right, we're not talking about your desire for like, you know, some sort of material object or your desire for a new house or your desire for, I mean, all of those things are, you know, relative, like way, <laughs> way down on the spectrum, right? But the, the, the object that magnetizes your attention is becoming increasingly expanded and increasingly subtle, right? That is sort of difficult to like say exactly where the edges of it are, right? All the way to a point where the energy of desire loses its object completely. Right? And he says, you come into contact with the formless form of beauty itself. And the sort of, you know, spiritual aspirant who has ascended to that point of having, um, you know, an immediate sort of encounter of touching uh, the, the form of beauty is then in the, the it's, it's, I mean, the, the creative energy then floods through the body of that aspirant and starts uh, animating her in such a way that everything that she does is an expression of her intimacy with the source of creative energy. Okay. Now, the process of Hatha Yoga that we started out describing, right, I want to say maps on perfectly, right, to, um, um, to this image that's described in the symposium, this progression of desire, right? Because what else is the, the, the raising of kundalini, right? But the movement of the vital force, which draws attention with it, right? Because wherever the prana goes, the chitta goes. So it's magnetizing your attention and lifting up through different sort of psychical centers in the body to bring your attention toward higher and higher spheres so that what you're sort of attending to um, itself uh, is becoming increasingly sort of ennobled, expanded, refined, right? So there's that the sort of movement from the lower chakras which have to do with survival and, you know, sexuality and the sort of, you know, most sort of raw and visceral sense, you know, up through the, you know, centers that have to do with ambition and with sort of goal-directed activity into the realm of human relationship in the heart, into the realm of creativity and vocalization and, um, and idea uh, in the throat, and then even higher uh, into, you know, the, 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 the intellect and then into sort of intuitive perception. And as the energy is sort of held in these different centers of consciousness, so too are the, uh, is, is that movement reflected in the objects of your attention. You see what I mean? Okay. Now, there's a lot of detail that I'm skimming over really quickly here because what I'm interested in is showing you, you know, and I'm painting in very broad strokes here, but showing you the interconnection, you know, between, uh, of, of certain ideas 
and there are other ways of getting at this point, especially through mythology and the story of the burning of Kama and so on and so forth. But there, the the soma that's in the in the crown of the head that gets melted and released when Kundalini Shakti makes her uh, journey, completes her journey to the to the to, or, or, or ascends to the apex um, in the center of the skull. Um, is is said to be cultivated by meditative practice. And the meditative practices that cultivate soma, that is, that put that, that and it's, it's always described as a milky white substance right, in the center of the skull. And indeed, you'll find, you know, if you look back at sort of old Hatha texts about the way that that nectar kind of, it, it can drip down into the, into the fire of the body, into the fire in the belly. And as the fire in the belly eats that nectar, because it loves it too, everything wants to eat it. God and demon alike want to drink that nectar. But as it, you know, drips into the fire of the belly, and the, fire, and the, the belly sort of consumes it, you know, according to an old Hatha idea, that sort of drains the, it, it drains the sort of deep prana that sustains your life. So when it's all gone, you die. <laughs> and that's why it said that you, if you turn yourself upside down in a headstand, for example, then the nectar doesn't drip into the fire, but it stays collected in the head. And so you can live longer by turning yourself upside down in that way, okay? Now, <laughs> that's, <laughs> that's of course an, an empirical uh, assertion that could be tested by empirical experiment. And I don't know that there have been any large scale studies. Um, I have my, my doubts as I'm sure you do too, but nonetheless, it's a metaphor for something, okay? And so we wanna sort of unravel that metaphor well, it's said that the, so the meditative practices that increase the soma in the head typically involve imagining that you are lifting sexual fluid from the center of the pelvis upward through the central axis of the body and then letting it sort of collect in the skull, okay? Now, this can sound super far out. This is not, you know, ordinarily sort of uh, advertised in contemporary yoga, but this is not at all a marginal idea. This is an idea that you find in Buddhist Tantra, you find, you know, all over the you know, early Hatha yoga manuals. It's an idea that informs, um, you know, Hatha yoga practice through and through. The idea is that the soma in the head is a sublimated form of sexual fluid. And it's often even said of semen, All right? So how exactly does that work for women then? Well, in some manuals it's said that, in some places it's suggested that actually women have that too. It's just, um, but you know, I don't know, that, that's, a, that's, a, that's a different discussion. But if you just think about, instead of worrying over the sort of, you know, the hydraulics behind the whole process, right? The basic idea is that that soma is a sublimated or rarefied form of erotic energy. That's what's symbolized by saying that the soma is a sublimated form of sexual fluid, okay? And indeed, then the, the Hatha yoga itself is the alchemical process that sublimates that 
erotic energy into soma. Okay. How does it do that? Right. Well, what's being suggested by that sort of the central process of hatha yoga is that it's through a progress, it, you know, it's through a, a progression of desire, right? In which your vital forces are lifted and elevated through higher and higher centers of awareness so that what you attend to and what you find beautiful is increasingly expanded until finally, and this is the most important point of the whole thing, your desire for beauty loses its object completely, which is to say it stops grasping at anything at all. Okay? Because the whole process that we described by reference to, to sort of Plato was a process of desire reaching toward a certain object and contemplating what it is that it's reaching for through the very act of reaching. Because the reaching, right, is what, it's the orectic energy and vitality behind all of your studies, behind all of your contemplations, right? Whether you're studying philosophy or psychology or spirituality or, you know, studying, you know, light as an artist, whatever it is that really draws and magnetizes your attention, right? You're contemplating that, right? So it's not even necessarily by saying that you're reaching for it, that you're trying to grasp it and hold it. That's part of it. But it's more than that, right? Is that there's something that you keep moving toward and something that you're, because there's something that you want to get closer to, right? And so then, you know, maybe even just as an artist, it's, there's, you know, some idea or some form or some image that you're sort of continuously pursuing, right? And the idea is that, that what that thing is, as you're contemplating it, keeps shifting, right? Now that, of course, is just a description of what, it, that's what human life is like, right? You sort of get into some project or you get into like studying something. You know, I think of my own, you know, the, the time I spent in, you know, studying academic philosophy, that my sense of what it was that I was doing and why I was doing it, or let's take yoga, right? <laughs> Yoga's the best example of all, that your sense of what, it, what you're doing and why you're doing it, if things are going well, deepens dramatically so that what you think you're doing is unrecognizable after some years from what you thought that you, you were doing when you first started out, right? Your reasons for doing it even, let's say, if we need to bring reasons into it at all, you know, become radically different, right? up to the point where you almost start to lose your reasons. Like it, it just becomes so much that you t it's sort of like you can't, you can't really, it's like loving another person, you know? That initial, there might be some reasons for that initial attraction, but when you really are fully in love, it's sort of, it's beyond the realm of reason. You're just sort of fully riveted. Like your attention is just fully there, you know, on the beloved. You're just drawn to it, right? There's nothing that you're trying to actually achieve or accomplish or get out of the contemplation. You're just completely absorbed in it, right? And the yoga itself is like that. Because what you're, you know, you realize eventually that you're, that, you know, there's something, call it the beloved, that you're drawn to, that you pursue through the ritual practices of yoga, through asana and pranayama and meditation that you come closer and closer and closer to that. And you have all kinds of ideas, your head's full of ideas about what that is, and you go crazy going out and you know, reading all the different texts that you can get your hands on, trying to get good, you know, better and better descriptions of what that is that you're getting closer and closer to. And as you get cl more closer and closer and closer to it, in a certain way, some of those things start to sort of fade away, right? Because the descriptions seem 
as if they never are really getting to the heart of the matter, but the experience is that you really are experiencing a deeper and deeper intimacy with whatever that is that's moving through you that you long to get closer and, and closer to. And there may come a moment when, and certainly you've tasted this moment, when you're not doing it to get anything for yourself at all. You're just doing it, you know, out of sheer love. And so you're just there with it. You're not trying to make anything happen. You're not hoping to experience less suffering. You're not hoping to dissolve your malas and overcome anxiety and, you know, get beyond desire, however you want to, you know, name the sort of destination of all your spiritual seeking that one day you find yourself totally unconcerned with any of that. <laughs> right? And simply overwhelmed with gratitude at the you know, gift that you've been so graciously given of simply having intimacy with that internal movement of creative energy that is manifesting as your experience in the present moment. Right? And this is, of course, the Hatha Yoga, right? And desire is what draws you into it, right? Your desire to get closer to, say, a, you know, a, a version of yourself that is, you know, that more sort of fully embodies what you care about, right? Or a sense of yourself that is, you know, more enlarged, more in line with the sort of the nobility of soul that you sort of know yourself to possess in some intuitive way and that, you've, that in your ordinary experience feels obscured and, and suppressed and, and unmanifest. Right? That, your, the, that desire is the vehicle then for spiritual ascent, but more that this is what's really fascinating is that the soma, if the soma is the sublimated energy of desire, right? In other words, the rarefied form, let's say mythologically, of Shakti's desire to spread herself out in the space of consciousness for the sake of consciousness becoming aware of itself, right? then when it's fully sublimated and it loses its object so that it's not reaching for anything anymore, it pervades the atmosphere of, of consciousness. That's the nectar pervasion experience, right? That's when the soma rains down, filling the nadis, filling all of the nadis with delight. Now, when it's... When it says that the, when the soma rains down, it, it, it floods the entire system of nadis, you have to remember that particular patterns of prana flowing through the sort of channels of the subtle body create the objects of experience, at least on this sort of subtle psychology of that, to which yoga uh, subscribes, okay? If that's so, then what it means in that context for creative energy, prana, right, to flood the, the nadis completely is that all of the perceptual channels are open, that nothing is deflected, Nothing is suppressed. Nothing is pushed into the shadow. But rather, the, the, the full movement of creative energy is allowed into the space of consciousness. Do you see what I'm saying? And that I hope that that reminds you of the image that we considered in the first talk of Patanjali listening closely to his thousand serpent heads 
you know, singing in different languages while staying firmly connected to the earth so that he's not distracted out of the present moment by any one of the, by any one of the um, voices. So, The nectar pervasion experience, according to the alchemy of Hatha Yoga, traditionally speaking, uh, is the experience of erotic energy or eros or kama released from its object, which is to say, and, and simply pervading the atmosphere of consciousness, which is to say the experience of selfless and sort of pure, objectless love, eros. So it's compassion as perfect openness to reality. And that's what the, that's what the soma, that's what the soma is. Okay. I think I'll stop there. <laughs>